Now that we have some familiarity with JShell, some of the commands and some of the Java syntax that you can run in JShell, I think it's time to pause and think about how this all works. We are familiar with how Java works. I'm assuming you have some experience with Java. You know that the way to work with Java is more of a sequential process. You write your code, you complete your code, right? You're done with everything that you want to program. Then you run the compiler. The compiler is going to look at the final state of your code and generate the bytecode, which you then execute. So it's more of a sequential process, right? You have to complete one step before you go to the next step. But with JShell, you don't have that sequential process anymore. It becomes more of an intertwined process. You write code, compile and run. Again, you write some more code, compile and run. And each time you're writing code, compiling and running, you are adding on to the existing state. So it's not like a final state anymore. It's like an evolving state rather. So this kind of gives us the questions that obviously come to mind. How does this work with Java? Java has been designed to be the sequential kind of a language, right? You complete ex writing the code before you even think about compiling it. So how does this work? Have the developers of the platform changed the structure of Java in order to facilitate this? Well, thankfully they haven't. Java still remains the way it is. However, when they've created JShell, they have provided this tool which works with Java considering the way it's been designed, but still allows for this kind of flexibility and this kind of a non-sequential interactive writing of code and execution of code. Now, how have they done that? The way JShell works also leads to a bunch of other technical questions, which we kind of mentioned in the beginning of this course. When you create a variable declaration, when we say int i equals 10, where is the variable i being created? You don't have a modifier here. You don't have a public or a private or whatever, because in the context of JShell, modifiers don't apply. You're not creating a member variable of a class. You're just declaring a variable in isolation. So how does it all fit together? How does this make sense in the context of Java? The answer is very simple. When you create variables like int i equals 10 in JShell, yes, you cannot create variables in isolation. It has to be a part of the class. But guess what JShell does? It actually maintains a class in the background. It's as simple as that. Whenever you add statements, whenever you declare variables in JShell, what JShell is actually doing is putting those variables into a class that it's maintaining in the background, right? It's hidden. It's not something that's obvious to you, but JShell is actually internally keeping track of that class. So whenever you make changes to the variable, JShell is actually making those changes to the class, right? Whenever we add methods, those methods are actually going to be a part of the class. So JShell is internally maintaining a class, and anytime you make changes or you add stuff or you remove stuff, JShell is constantly updating that class in the background so that it remains consistent with what you're doing in the shell. So that was an overview of how JShell works, kind of at a high level, and that's all you need to know to actually use JShell. But if you're a Java developer, you're probably curious to know how it actually manages it, what are the, what are the details, what are the internals of how this works. So if you're interested in that, now we're gonna get into the details in this video. Feel free to skip it if you're not interested, but I think knowing this is gonna help you understand how JShell manages all these things and kind of helps you work with JShell better. So I hope you continue to watch. So here is where we're gonna get into the details. Assume that when you have JShell running, the shell creates this wrapper class called REPL, right? This is an arbitrary name, not so arbitrary as we'll discover later, but assume that whenever you run a JShell session, JShell is in the background creating this class called REPL. Now, when you run a command, let's say I run int i equals 10, what happens is JShell actually creates a static variable called i, which is an integer, in that wrapper class. So every time you execute a command like this, which declares a variable, what you're actually doing is creating a member variable in this wrapper class that you don't have access to, but it's something that JShell maintains. So this is what happens when you declare a variable in the i equals 10 and you assign it, the value 10 to the variable i, JShell is implicitly in the background without your knowledge, creating a static member variable to this hidden wrapper class. And this works with, say, a string. So if you write a string, str equals hello, guess what JShell does? It creates that member variable, static member variable, called the same variable name, with the same data type, assigned to the same value. Why is JShell doing this? JShell does this because, again, this variable declaration, int i equals 10, 
or string str equals hello cannot exist in isolation in Java. It doesn't make sense to have a variable without it being a part of a class. Like we discussed before, every code in Java has to be a part of a class or an interface. It cannot just float in isolation. So this is how JShell makes this work. This is how JShell makes these arbitrary statements work. It does it by creating these member variables inside a hidden class. And this is how the Java compiler is happy. Now, what happens if we were to redeclare i? So let's say this is our session, right? So we've created int i equals 10, string str equals hello. Now we know that JShell in the background is creating these member variables of the Ripple class. What happens if I redeclare i? So let's say I make long i equals 20, right? I'm redeclaring it. Now we know that this works in JShell. Now what JShell is actually doing is when it when you redeclare a variable, it's going to that top level class, it finds that variable declaration, notices that it's already there. So it basically removes that variable declaration from that class and it creates a new variable declaration with that new type. And this is why when you redeclare a variable, the old variable declaration is last. That's because JShell implicitly removes that previous declaration and adds the new declaration. It has to do that because in the context of Java, when you have a class like this, the one that JShell is maintaining in the background, it cannot technically have another variable declaration of the same name. It wouldn't work, so it has to get rid of the old one. So that's what JShell does behind the scenes. It gets rid of the previous declaration and adds a new member variable declaration. This works the same way for methods as well. So let's say I have a method here, string greeting, which returns hello as a string. Guess what happens? JShell creates a method on this class. This is again a question that we had to answer. Just like where the variables go when you declare it in a JShell session, where do these methods go? Where do these functions go? Methods cannot exist in isolation. Well, it turns out they're actually methods. JShell actually creates methods on this class. If you were to create variables, which use other variables, so for instance, let's say I have a long k equals i times two, well, this gets translated to a static long k equals i times two. So what you're doing over here when you use a variable is refer to the previously declared member variable. So here, when you do a long k equals i times two, what you're actually doing is creating a new member variable on this class, which refers to a previously declared member variable in that same class. So whenever you're referring to variables that you've declared in a JShell session, realize that you're actually referring to member variables of this implicit class that you've previously declared. So this is why you get access to previous member variables. And this also answers the question, why static? This is something that you might have uh, thought about when I was showing you all these snippets. Why does JShell create these as static member variables? It creates it as static because if you make it as static, you have access to those member variables without creating an instance. So JShell is actually not creating an instance per se, at least not in the sense that you would create instances. It is making these as static because here, when you create something like K, you can have access to those member variables without having to create an instance. Okay, now what happens if you run arbitrary snippets? So we looked at uh, the system.out.println, hello, right? How does JShell map this to the traditional model of having Java statements run only in the context of a class or an interface? Well, what JShell does is when you run these arbitrary methods, which don't return any value, right? System.out.println does not return any value. So when you're typing this to JShell, all you wanna do is have it run. So what JShell does is it creates a static block in this top level class and then puts your statements in that static block. We have multiple statements separated by semicolon. It puts all those statements inside that static block. And this is why JShell can facilitate Java to run these statements even though they are not technically a part of a class because, well, behind the scenes, they actually are a part of a class. They are in a static block in the class. And this is why it works. Very well, now what happens if you're calling a function that returns a value or maybe you're running an expression that returns a value? Well, then you know what happens. JShell creates scratch variables. And just like you would imagine, these scratch variables are no different from variables that you would create what it does is it figures out the line number and then it creates these member variables in this top level class and the value of that member variable is going to be the result of that expression. So this is how JShell is managing your JShell session and this is why it still works. It's still Java, right? We haven't lost 
the strictness of Java, the rules of Java that you've been familiar with all these years, that's still there. All these statements still need to be executed in the context of a class or an interface. And this is how JShell manages to do it. So this is the platform team kind of improvising and making this work by creating this class in the background so that the Java compiler is happy and the Java interpreter is happy. Now, this leads to the final question. Where is the compilation phase and where is the interpreter phase? When you run Java applications yourself, you need to run a compile, either by running that in the command prompt or right-clicking on Eclipse or any of your IDEs. You have to do that, right? How does this happen? Well, this is very similar to a lot of other REPL prompts in a lot of other languages. Whenever you have this kind of a prompt like this, the read, evaluate, print loop prompt for these compiled or interpreted languages, the compiler forms a thin layer over the shell. So whenever you run a command like this, not only does JShell create this class in the background and kind of make it synchronized with your commands, it also has a compilation layer and an execution layer. So the compilation layer is constantly compiling this REPL class that JShell maintains, and then it executes it so that the code that you've run is actually executed and the results are being sent to JShell. So JShell constantly monitors the result of that execution and then displays it to the console. And one last thing I wanna leave you with, when you run these statements, JShell is actually maintaining a line number, right? So the first statement is line number one, the second statement that you run in JShell is line number two, and JShell uses those line numbers in order to uh, name the scratch variables. We've already seen that. Not only does it maintain that, when it translates your JShell prompts to Java syntax in this top level class, that syntax that it creates is assigned the line number which corresponds to the line number over here. So for instance, if you have long i equals 20 uh, as line number three in your JShell prompt, assume that it's almost like static long i equals 20 in line number three in the REPL class, all right? It does not, al does not do a literal line number, but assume that it's almost as if, for all practical purposes, putting that corresponding line in the class in the same line number. This will be useful in the very next video, which is error handling. But hopefully, this concept makes sense for all practical purposes. This model is what JShell is maintaining behind the scenes to make these individual statements work in the context of Java. So keep this in the back of your mind. This is very helpful every time you're working with JShell. You don't actually have to think about each statement being a member variable or each statement being a static block, but it addresses a lot of these behaviors you see with JShell and it kind of explains how JShell still manages to do what it does while working on the Java platform that has the restrictions that we already know.